Welcome to this uh, Giants of Cardiothoracic Surgery interview at the uh, 55th Annual STS meeting. Uh, we're uh, honored to be joined by Dr. Gerald Darling from Toronto, Ontario. Uh, Dr. Darling is a professor of surgery at the University of Toronto and the Crest Family Chair in Esophageal Cancer Research at the Toronto General Hospital and University Health Network. Dr. Darling, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Vab. I'm honored, honored to be invited to this Giants lecture. That really is quite an honor to be here. So uh, the uh, purpose of the interview is just to get to know you a little bit more. It's mainly geared towards trainees uh, to help them understand how you've crafted your career, uh, what got you interested in thoracic surgery and particularly esophageal surgery, and hopefully we can draw some pearls that uh, we can apply as we're going through our training. Well, I, um, I guess I can start. I was born in London, Ontario, which is uh, about two hours west of Toronto and I did my all my schooling there and undergraduate and medical school and general surgery training and then I did two years of research uh, in the at the NCI in the surgery branch and then I did my thoracic training at the Mayo Clinic and then I got a job back in Toronto and I've been in Toronto since that time um, always at a university affiliated hospital but I started out at a small hospital and then Eventually ended up at the Toronto General Hospital, which is kind of the mecca, which is, was my goal. So that, that uh, worked out very well. I, um, I guess I kind of fell into surgery, uh, I, I'm not quite as well planned as most people. I was going to be a family doctor, and then I did my surgery rotation as a clerk, and that was the end of that. Mm -hmm. I, I was just, you, you get that surgery bug, and this is what I, this is what I have to do. And, uh, and then when I did my general surgery training, I worked with uh, Richard Finley, uh, Dr. Richard Finley. And that's probably where I got my bug for thoracic surgery and esophageal surgery. Um, okay. So that's kind of how it started. So you were saying when you were clerkship, you caught the surgery bug. Was it, uh, was it something about the work or was there a mentor that guided you? Not, um, it's the work. I didn't really, uh, in those days, we didn't really have mentors. Certainly, there were no women mentors. Um, uh, I liked the people I was working with. You know, it's kind of that birds of a feather. You, you feel like you belong in this this home, this surgery home. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really what I like. I liked the pace. I liked that we made decisions and we did stuff. And uh, it really suited me. I, I, that's what I loved about it. And I got into thoracic surgery partly because I loved complex surgery and I loved the physiology and the anatomy and the, the worst thing for me was to do an ingle and hernia repair. Like I just like, I cannot do that. Um, you know, to get into operating the chest and the anatomy was fabulous and I, I mean, it was just, I don't, everything was at a higher level. It was much more exciting. It was much more rewarding. You really made a difference to people. Um, that really appealed to me. Mm -hmm. Within thoracic surgery, you've focused on esophageal cancer uh, and esophageal surgery, which uh, many people recognize as one of the more uh, compl complex and challenging uh, parts of thoracic surgery. Uh, so tell us a bit about uh, why you uh, got into esophageal surgery. Well, I always liked, I mean, I like general surgery. Um, I like the GI surgery. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, I like complex surgery. Uh, so I've always had an interest in esophageal surgery and esophageal cancer in particular. Um, some of it was strategic, you know, there were people already working in lung cancer, people already working in transplant, and here was, nobody really wanted to do esophageal surgery because, you know, it's all those complications and all those problems, and it was a challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, this, there were a lot, of a lot of problems with it, and I thought, I'm gonna put my head down and work hard and see if I can sort out some of those problems. And, uh, and of course, my, my colleagues were happy to let me have it because they didn't want to do it. Right. Or they didn't want to do too much of it. Now, you, you mentioned that uh, it's an area where some people didn't want to work, and we know that it's been challenging to secure funding for esophageal cancer research. Um, but you built a large uh, esophageal cancer research program. Yeah. So how did that unfold? 
Well, again, I was, uh, you know, f interested in it, and I realized I, I learned from my colleagues doing work in other areas. Uh, for example, you know, Dr. Kashavji doing the transplant research. It starts with having good clinical data, so we built a clinical database. Um, you, if you can show you have good outcomes, people refer you patients. Your volume grows. You get more experience. Uh, and so just having the clinical data and having was, was uh, you know, allowed us to really get started. And then I was lucky. I had a philanthropic donation that really allowed me to uh, expand that and uh, start a translational research program and uh, to expand the, even the clinical program where we uh, developed a really uh, collegial, multidisciplinary group uh, that allows us to collaborate on clinical trials as well as translational research. Mm -hmm. So phila philanthropy has been huge. We are still struggling to get grant funding. What are some of the projects that um, you're working on that you're most excited about? Oh gosh, there's a few, quite a few of those. Um, we've been able to look at our clinical outcomes and you may know about the esophageal, uh, esophagectomy uh, cancer esophagectomy complications group, ECCG, mm -hmm. and they developed a worldwide uh, collaboration and logged the complications of esophagectomy mm -hmm. from uh, multiple uh, high volume centers across the world. Mm -hmm. And um, we looked at our own results and uh, we, f we contributed to ECCG because we could do that because we had our database. Uh, but we were able to benchmark our results and show that our outcomes are as good as anybody's and sometimes better. Um, so that, that was very rewarding to be able to contribute to that effort and also to say, hey, I, we are doing a good job. We've done a lot of work on quality of life uh, after esophagectomy, showing, um, first of all, that baseline quality of life is a very powerful predictive tool of how that person's going to do and, and what their survival will be. Um, we've done some population work, in fact you're doing some population work with us, looking at the effect of regionalization, looking at readmissions and emergency room visits and those sorts of things. So we've kind of come at it in all directions. And then more recently, the translational lab, which started out looking at microRNA, we're now uh, growing cancer organoids um, from uh, biopsies, preoperative biopsies. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're kind of on the leading edge on that because most organoids are grown from tumor resections. Mm -hmm. And as you probably know, most cancers now, esophageal cancers, are treated preoperatively. Mm -hmm. So when you do look at the resected specimen, you're not really getting the, the, what it was really like to start with. So right. we're, we're able to grow the cancer organoids and characterize them, and then we're able to test them, drug test them. And, mm -hmm. uh, so that's very exciting work. Okay, well, uh, thanks for telling us about that research program. I want to switch into health policy. And uh, you uh, have been involved in the leadership of um, Ontario's cancer program, particularly in thoracic oncology. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that work and, and uh, how that has contributed to your um, efforts to advance uh, thoracic oncology care? You know, if you think about your work as a physician, surgeon, you know, you can treat one patient at a time, you can make a difference in those people's lives. Um, and that's a tremendous privilege to be able to do that. Um, but to be able to make a difference to a lot of people, you need to look at systems. And um, trying to improve the cancer system uh, was um, something I really wanted to participate in, and particularly in thoracic cancers. And so uh, we participated in the development of the regionalization of uh, thoracic surgery centers in the province. Um, prior to that, we had developed a, I participated in the development of thoracic standards. What should a thoracic center look like? Who are the people there, the, resor the human resources? What are the physical resources? Uh, and that that landmark paper, um, which I co-authored with Dr. Donna Maziak, served as the foundation for the Cancer Care Ontario Thoracic Standards document. 
Um, so we developed these level one centers to improve the delivery of thoracic surgery care. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's been very effective in reducing mortality uh, from surgical procedures. We then participated in, and I led with two others, development of quality indicators. So you can do an operation, but is it a good, you know, is the operation I do the same as the operation someone else does? So we developed indicators that would guide us on that. Um, and I learned a lot about measurement mm -hmm. and, um, and also data, the, the, the problems with data. Um, and so you get these results back and you say, well, that doesn't seem right. And sure enough, when you look in more depth, you see that it's not right. And I think that speaks to the importance of having clinicians involved in these systems because the administrators have no idea, right? They can just get the data back, they believe it. But we look at it and we go, that doesn't make sense to us. So then we dive deeper and get the real story. So we've, I, I, that was very rewarding work. And um, now I've just uh, been, I, I was privileged to be chosen as the clinical lead for the screening program. So lung cancer screening, of course, is going to save huge numbers of lives from lung cancer. And in the province, we wanted to implement it as a provincial program, not just an individual hospital program. And so I've been the lead on the um, the pilot study for that. It's not, not a study of does lung cancer screening work. Mm -hmm. It's really of a, a study of how to implement it in a population-based method, right. um, which is quite different than a lot of places are doing where you just, the people in your catchment area or you send out letters or whatever. Um, You're trying to capture the whole population in the province of Ontario, yes. which is about 14 million people. 14 million people. So on how to do that cost effectively, right? Because uh, you know we're a single payer system, so we can't uh, we can't spend too much money. But that's that's uh, that's going to make a huge difference, and uh, you know that's so rewarding, you know, to be able to make a difference to a whole population. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been very that's been very rewarding work. The uh, the final thing I'd like to talk about is. Um, Sir, um, thoracic surgery training and mentorship. And uh, you were the program director for thoracic surgery at the University of Toronto for, uh, for many, many years. 11. 11 years. Um, so you've had a, a big role in designing the training program, mentoring uh, trainees. What were some of the highlights from your time as program director? Well, I think uh, just uh, philosophically, uh, just like uh, implementing the screening program provides an opportunity to uh, benefit a lot of people. Uh, training the surgeons of tomorrow or the, the doctors of tomorrow, if you're training medical students, is an opportunity to improve the health of a lot of people. Um, you know, like you can operate on one patient, but you can train a, a, a resident who's then going to go out and operate on a huge number of patients. So again, it's, it's an opportunity to, to provide for uh, good to a lot of people. So I think the highlight for me in being the program director was really the opportunity to interact with so many bright, energetic young people, gifted young people. Mm -hmm. um, and I've established friendships that have lasted for years. Um, and to see somebody come into the program and see them grow and become an accomplished surgeon and know that they're going to go out and be successful. Um, that, that was huge. That was huge. You mentioned that when you were going through your training, uh, there, there were not many female mentors. And uh, you wrote a chapter with uh, Dr. Maziak in, the, in this book by Dr. Delorier, Dr. Pearson, and uh, Dr. Nellums um, about uh, women in thoracic surgery in Canada. <coughs> and uh, you talked about how there were few mentors, but since that time, and particularly while you were the program director, um, there have been many female trainees yes. out of the Toronto program. Could you talk a bit about that? About the women in the program? Mm -hmm. And the influence that um, you have had on mentoring women and bringing women into the field. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that I had much influence in bringing them into the field. I think as a, as a group, though, um, having 
women role models, uh, not necessarily mentors, but just seeing that women could do it uh, was, was the important piece. That um, not you could do the surgery, you could have a life, you could, you know, it wasn't mutually exclusive. Um, and I think that that was really uh, the importance of that was just seeing that someone could do it, a woman could do it, you know, and I have three children and, you know, I can do, you know, I can do that. And so some other woman can do that. Um, it was more just showing it was possible. And, right. and a lot of the, and when we wrote that chapter, uh, Donna and I had a lot of preconceived ideas about, we interviewed all those women. We had a lot of preconceived ideas about what they would say about their training and so on. And what was really quite heartening was that all the younger women, you know, they they just trained. There was there was no there were no issues for them, like there had been for us, and that was good to see. You know, we we still know that there's some biases out there and so on, uh, but at least for these women in Canada, and on a, you know, that was like a non-issue, like completely a non-issue. And I think uh, that that's fabulous. You know, they didn't go through all the stuff that we went through, um, and that's good. So uh, just as we um, uh, approach the end of the interview, I'd like to ask, looking forward um, in the field of thoracic surgery or esophageal surgery, uh, what do you think our biggest opportunities are? What, uh, what makes you most excited about the next five to 10 years in the field? Well, that's a big ask. You know, there's so many great things going on. Um, I think diversity is important, and I think even in our own division, there are two women, well, three women now in our division, and that has changed the culture and the discussion, and um, they work just as hard. We work just as hard as the guys do, and, uh, and, and they, the men value our input, and uh, we're accepted as part of the team. Um, so that's only going to expand uh, going forward. I think the human resource is always the most important thing. I mean, uh, we just heard the talk today from Eric Topol that the machines will take over some of the some of the work, but they will not take over the empathy and the caring. And and I think that that will be an important part of our practice going forward. Obviously, the advance of innovative techniques for uh, surgical techniques, minimally invasive surgery, robotics, but also endoscopic therapies. Those are coming uh, for esophageal cancer, for lung cancer, um, and I think that we're going to get less and less and less invasive, and we're going to be able to do so much more uh, without cutting open the chest and uh, those sorts of things. So I, I think that's where we're going and I think we'll increase our collaboration with our oncology colleagues in terms of immunotherapy and combination therapies. Uh, so I think the future is bright. Okay, well, Dr. Darling, thank you so much for joining us. It's um, been amazing to talk about your impact in the clinical world, research world, um, health policy and education. So. Uh, it's our, our honor to have you in the uh, Giants interview, and thank you for taking this time. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you.